My name is Albert Lee. I'm from UCLA, the device research lab there. Um, my advisor is Professor Kang Wang from UCLA, too. Um, so today, I am going to give a brief introduction of how we modeled diverse neural activity in the neural networks. Um, so my topic here, you see diverse neurons and inhomogeneous, sorry, heterogeneous neural networks. Um, this talk is going to be more or less like a walkthrough of the method, so um, no equations, which is nice for engineers. Um, so a brief outline of this talk. First, I will go through the uh, present day description of neuromorphic computing and what we see that disagrees with the biological nervous system. Um, based on these observations, we will then propose a method for modeling this diverse neural activity and um, <clears throat> use it to model certain special neural behavior in the nervous system. Uh, with these models, we then do some initial experiments and show that it can improve upon the uh, conventional. So, um, introduction. Uh, neuromorphic computing generally refers to computing structures methods, algorithms that were inspired by the biological nervous system. And uh, currently, it is applied to a very diverse region of um, applications. Basically, in any application that we find, it is a little hard to um, explicitly program. And e examples of this include like uh, decision making, um, forecasting image recognition, um, and all sorts of these. And because of their success, a lot of major companies have begun to adopt neuromorphic computing, um, some sort, either hardware or software, or, or a uh, spiking neural network, whatever it is, into their products. So at the core of all of this computing methods is that no matter what the structure is, no matter how um, the algorithm updates it, the core of it is all neural networks. And neural networks are where you have a uh, network of interconnected neuron models, mathematical. And between these connections, there are weights. So during training, you update these weights so that the entire network can best fit your target application. <clears throat> now, uh, the most common and well-known neural model is the Mapitz um, neuron. So it's shown right there, uh, which that neuron basically computes the input times the weights and then pass through an activation function. And this, entire, this same model is incorporated in the entire network, which means that the network itself is homogeneous in terms of the neurons itself. So this actually is different from the biological case because in the biological neural network, um, especially the human brain, the neurons are extremely diverse. In fact, thousands of neurons have been classified based on their shape, um, their sizes, their connections, and more importantly, their electrical response and their spatial temporal arrangements. So this diversity is very important because it not only contributes to um, increasing versatility and adaptiveness, but it's also shown in a lot of different fields that diversity uh, actually is critical for, for operation. For example, um, in evolution, you have like a diverse population will more likely survive than a homogeneous um, species. And in computer science, we have just shown in lunch today that there's this uh, uh, famous person who said that a network has to be as, as least as complex as it, the task it is trying to compute. And if you look at accelerators today, you see that it's actually inhomogeneous for it, the performance to boost up. It has accelerators, different accelerators in every way. So looking at this, we need to find a way to model this diversity. And in this work, we focus on the particularly on the electrical response of the neurons. So um, more particularly, we look at how elect electrical response of a neuron can be dynamically modified. And in the biological neural system, this can occur in several ways. So you have uh, neurotransmitters or neuromodulators. These are basically chemical messages that operate on a neuron's uh, receptors or ion channels. And then these change the response of the neuron. Um, there's also glia cells, as mentioned in the talk yesterday. Um, neurotransmitters operate in a slightly smaller region. They occur at the synapses. They um, often affect a single or just a few neurons. Uh, neuromodulators, on the other hand, they affect a larger region. Um, 
So in addition to these types of uh, targeting the neurons receptors, there's also the activation or deactivation of genetic expressions. So in this case, there are actually uh, genetic expressions that change the neurons um, inhibitory response or excitatory response, which is similar to changing the normalization of the neuron. So these are all uh, diverse effects in the neuron that modify a neuron's response. Now, the common context of all of these modifications is that a control signal, an input control signal from a source, whether it's a transmitter or a modulator, changes the dynamic response of the neuron. And that pretty much sums up our scheme. So in a neural model, you see that the response of a neuron is characterized by its activation function. So the scheme translates to that a control signal source, um, which we call L right here, um, a control signal can modify the activation function of a neuron. So we call this a conditional activation function. So in this scheme, if you look at the bottom part, it's basically the conventional neuron where you have the weighted sum or membrane potential pass through the activation to generate the output. Um, but then on the top, you have this condition here where dynamically, based on the condition here, uh, one of these different activation functions are selected dynamically to be used in the model. So for example, in this graph you see right here, um, the condition or control L consists of two channels, L1 and L2, and when both of these channels are activated, then our response is a ReLU. When one is activated, you get the leaky ReLU or the binary step, or when uh, none of these control channels are activated, it's basically a sigmoid function. So that is basically the, uh, what we propose as called the conditional activation scheme. Now, this scheme is, uh, actually can be applied to a very large amount of different applications. For example, you can do threshold shifting. You can dynamically shift the threshold. You can have the ReLU, a shifted ReLU, and then the shifted, shifted ReLU. Or you can do things like a lateral inhibition where you have a ReLU and then change the slope, change the threshold, or things of that sort. So now that we have this scheme, what we actually need to do is we need to design it. Um, we need to take a look at biological inspirations and look at what are the responses in the actual neuron. So on the bottom part here, we basically already have in the existing neuron networks. So we need to um, look at the top part up here. What do we need to design? And uh, more or less like a top to bottom approach uh, from the top of the, uh, top of the, what do you call this? Um, top of the slide to the bottom of the slide. Um, first thing we see is that these functions up here. So we need to design what are these functions up there. Is it a ReLU, is it a leaky ReLU, or is it some other function? Um, to do this, we're going to have to look at the biological neurons in the nervous system. Going a little bit downwards, uh, we have the function design, now we have to look at these connections here, which is how do these control signals map to each of these functions? So in this case that we show here, when the, both of the channels are active, you get a ReLU, but in the biological case, it might be very different. Um, when multiple channels are active, for example, you could actually have no response at all. That completely inhibits the neuron's response. So you would have a flat line rather than a real function. Uh, so that's our two first des design constraints. The third is we need to look at how this signal is generated. So where do these control signals come from? Does it come from local synapses, um, similar to the glia cells? or the neurotransmitters? Um, does it come from a different network, such as neuromodulators? Or does it come from its own history, for example, um, that's the genetic expressions that gets changed? So to answer these questions, uh, we again look at special functions that exist in the neural system. And this time we look at the visual and auditory systems because um, in, in, in the human brain, this is where that takes most of the uh, processing parts. And it's probably going to perform best if we look at these functions for image or, sig or signal processing. So uh, one special neuron that we see is the synchronous detection or coincidence detection in the uh, cochlear nucleus. And the characteristic of this neuron is that this neuron only fires when it has multiple inputs spiking simultaneously. So you can see here, that if two inputs are coming here at the same time, then the neuron spikes. However, if there's a phase delay, 
in the two inputs, then it does not spike, regardless of how strong your input is, um, how frequent it is, or the amplitude of it. And this function is actually very precise. So uh, research on this has shown that it can actually detect precision down to several microseconds, which is well below the spiking frequency of our neurons themselves. And uh, it's also shown that people who have synchrony even just a little bit off, so they can't completely synchronize it, then they will have issues in detecting um, speech recognition. Okay, that's the first function is synchronous detection. Uh, the second function that we see is important is the uh, max function. This is perhaps a little well known. Um, it's otherwise known as the complex cell. So this function computes the max of its input. So you have a uh, figure shown here. This is the input one and input two, and the output here resembles the larger one of its inputs. So this is the max function. And um, we have neuroscience experiments and computer science experiments, uh, especially CNN, showing that this max function provides invariance and allows a network or an organism to understand an image even though it has shifting or noise or um, spatial temporal uh, shifting stuff. So these two functions are the ones we look at to create our conditional activation function. Now, to map these two functions to conditional activation, um, we first create a truth table of their behaviors. So you can see here that you have the two inputs, in one, in two. If they both fire at the same time, then the neuron fires. If they don't fire at the same time, then the neuron is silent. So that is the truth table for the synchronous detection. And then we map the two inputs to the condition uh, and the membrane potential, respectively. So we have in one to L, in two to M. And then finally, we map the firing and silent to be larger or lower than the threshold. So you have the firing to be larger than zero, um, non-firing to be lower than zero. Here we choose the threshold to be zero. So uh, from this graph, you can now see here we have what we can use to build the conditional activation function used in uh, um, artificial neural network. So you see here, when the channel L is inactive, then the output is going to be a zero regardless of uh, what, the, what your uh, membrane potential is, which you basically have a flat function as shown in the green here. And if you have the case that L is active, then your output is equal to zero if the membrane potential is smaller than zero, and it is equal, we're assuming here, that it is equal to um, the membrane potential otherwise. So this can be characterized by a ReLU function. So that gives us our uh, conditional activation design for synchronous detection, which in the case that the condition is active, then you have a ReLU function. If the condition is inactive, then there's no response in the neuron at all. And uh, what's interesting is that um, yesterday there was this talk which said that neurons can act as little logic gates. Um, in fact, the synchrony detection function is basically is a little logic gate. It's uh, here and here are identical. It's the AND gate in computing. And uh, following a similar approach, we can build the truth table of the max neuron. So in this case, you have two inputs in one and in two. Damn it, I can't find the, yeah. In one and in two. And the max function is it takes the larger of the inputs. So whenever any of these fire, then your output is going to fire, which gives us the truth table up there. And again, we map uh, the two inputs to the condition and the membrane potential, and the firing to be larger or smaller than zero. So with this graph here, now what you see is in the case that the condition is inactive, then the output is zero if your uh, membrane potential is negative, and it's equal to the membrane potential otherwise, which is, again, the relative function. And in the condition that your channel is active, your condition is active, then your output is equal to the inverse of the membrane potential if the membrane potential is negative, and it's equal to the membrane potential itself if it is positive. So to model this, we choose the, um, the what do you call it? Absolute function. So in this case, you have the um, conditional activation for the max neurons, which you get when the channel is inactive, you get the uh, relative function. When the channel is active, you get the absolute value function. So again, uh, what's interesting is that this function is basically the OR function in computing logic. So you'll see that 
uh, the max function, if you map it here, it's exactly the same as the lower function. So now uh, with these two neural models, we then do some experiments by creating a heterogeneous network instead of a homogeneous network. Um, we test this on a multi-layer perception, NLP, which is basically fully connected layers here. Um, we constructed a four-layer um, multi-layer perceptron. In the conventional one, everything is conventional neurons with a relative function, and the output is fed through a softmax layer. In the proposed heterogeneous network, we have half of the second hidden layer replaced by the synchrony neurons, or the and neurons, and half replaced by the uh, max neurons, or what we call the or neurons. And the conditions, because, because of the way we modeled it, the conditions of each neuron is connected to the membrane potential of a random neuron in the same layer. Uh, we do not apply any other sort of different algorithms. We don't apply um, dropout, uh, data augmentation, or anything else. So we trained this on the MNIST data set and uh, recorded the recognition error rate as a function of the training epochs. Um, as you see here, you have the solid line is the average among five training trials. Um, the semi-transparent lines in the background, I can't really find this dot. Oh, the semi-transparent lines in the background are the individual trials themselves. So here you see that um, for exactly the same number of neurons, number of layers, and the exact same algorithms, training algorithms, you see that the eventual error of the homogeneous network achieves 3%, while that of the heterogeneous network achieves 2.4%. So we see about a 20% decrease in the error rate. And what's more is that if you look at the time it takes to achieve that performance, so the epochs that it takes to achieve 99% of the final recognition rate, there's also a decrease. In the homogeneous network, you get 260 epochs, while in the heterogeneous, you get 140. So that's almost a two times of speed up in a number of epochs. Um, and we repeated this experiment by reducing the number of layers, which increases the error rate. Um, three layers, 100 neuron per layer, the conventional gets 3.3% error, while the proposed heterogeneous network gets 2.7%. So again, you'll see a decrease in the final error rate. Um, again, if we look at the time it takes to reach the final error, 99%, uh, it is a decrease from 180 to 130. So uh, we then repeated this experiment across a large variety of different layers and different neurons. So three to four layers, so 100 to 400 neurons. You can see that the error rate and the training time both improve for all of these conditions. Um, it may be more or less, but it always improves. Uh, also, for the penalty in the amount of parameters stored, it is very, very small, less than 2%, sorry, less than 0.2%. Um, we use that to store the random connections. And uh, for similar recognition error and similar training time, it actually reduces the number of uh, parameters by two to three times. So uh, that's our results. In summary, what we did was uh, we introduced a method, a scheme, for modeling the diverse neural activity um, with particular focus on dynamically modifying the neuron's function. Um, and using this scheme, we modeled two special neurons, um, the synchronous detection neuron, which is in the cochlear nucleus, um, and the max neuron, which exists in the visual pathway. And using these two neurons to create a heterogeneous network, we showed performance improvement across several different scales. So that's a preliminary experiment result. And this demonstrated somewhat the role of diversity in neural networks. Um, however, what we have here is a very crude, very simplified model of mapping neuron behavior to artificial neural networks so that it fits in the current existing mainframe. And as a matter of fact, the human diversity is much more than just these two there is a lot of application-specific cells. For example, you see here, the um, cochlear nucleus has the synchronous detection. That's because you need to detect temporal information. Uh, the max neuron is because you need to detect spatial information. And the uh, 
I think it was mentioned in a talk today that place cells and grid cells, they're probably very important for navigation tasks. So there are a lot of task-specific or application-specific neurons in the nervous system, which would probably be essential for these specific tasks. And uh, that is something that we need to look into. Another thing that is pretty important is how does this diversity impact the learning of the network? For example, um, there are neurons that learn. They're very plastic. There are neurons that don't learn at all. They're basically static. Um, there's also neurotransmitters that change this behavior. They can make learning very facilitated, or they can make uh, basically someone forget everything in the past few hours. Um, last but not least, I want to quote something from yesterday's talk, is that we are horrible at designing uh, heterogeneous structures. However, the structure in these neural networks is very important because these structures give rise to intrinsic functions in the system. For example, you have, um, you have visual pathways. This is not learned. Uh, you have reflexes, intrinsic safety rules. These are also not learned. They exist in the neural system itself. And uh, you also have like intrinsic goals where you have survival, um, feeding, um, basically the four Fs if in the nervous system too. So these all arise from the organization of these special functions. And um, with that, I would like to conclude my talk and acknowledge um, my boss here, uh, Dr. Kang Wang from UCLA, and my colleagues, Bonnie Lam, Wen Yuan Li, and Ho Chi Li. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> One thought, um, have, you, have you considered how, I mean, I think you maybe alluded to it a little bit at the end, but um, how perhaps you can have the training of these activation functions be part of the training process? Since you're seeing that the, every neuron behaving a little differently, or maybe a mixed code is, has performance benefits, can you train a network can you, can you open up the training to include the sort of activation functions? Mm -hmm. uh, that is a very good question. And in fact, there are people who's done a little bit of work on training the activation functions. Uh, essentially, if you look at the bias inside a neuron, you're basically training the, um, the threshold of the neuron. But some of these functions in the neural system, they're, not, they're, they're functions that exist in the neuron that are not trainable. They're basically basic functions under the neuron themselves. So, that is what we're trying to do in this work. We're trying to look at these functions that exist themselves rather than train the functions. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you.